All right, guys, we'll see if I am live. It says that it's still waiting on me, but we never know. Love my setup here. All right, looks like I'm live. I don't have uh, <laughs> I don't have my screen here showing me I'm live, but I'm seeing people with that are waiting, and I'm going to assume that I'm live. Leave me a comment if I'm live, guys, so I don't sit here and just kind of look like an idiot. <laughs> All right. Well, anyway, we're gonna move forward and assume I am live. Yep, we're set. Thanks. What's up, John Jones? Okay. Uh, the fact that I put myself on here kind of blows my mind because uh, I just got back from, it took me about five hours to get back. I actually stopped and did some stuff for work from uh, Baltimore. Uh, Charlton 66 lives in Maryland. He let me stay with him over the weekend. We went up to Baltimore Con. I have two live shows on this channel. Go make sure you go sub Charlton 66. And um, the only thing that I got to say is that it was a fantastic weekend. But I got to tell you, man, uh, the only thing that I think I need to check myself on is my sleep. Uh, Friday morning, I was started, I, I, you know, I think I started getting up around 4 and 4.30 or something. And then I finally got a bed, out of bed at 6.30. Got to, you know, drove, worked all day, drove all the way out there to Maryland um, from the other end of Virginia. And then I couldn't kind of sleep a little bit because I was wired. So I had very little sleep this whole weekend. So the fact that uh, they put up with me was awesome. I saw, okay, John Jones, I saw the post on Instagram. Looked like a great turnout. It was. It was fantastic. So now I want to show my haul video, right? So uh, I think next time that I go to these things, I'm going to have to plan my sleep a little bit. I actually got home today. Uh, got something to eat, unwound a little bit, tried to take a nap. I wouldn't. So the fact that I'm on here and I let myself look like this on here blows my mind. Great, man. All right, so quick jump right into the comic book haul, man. Uh, this haul is going to be a little bit different. Now, Charleston 66, comic quarter 410, a few other people I kind of ran into, they got some great hauls. Me, on the other hand, I'm doing this thing where I'm actually staying focused. I'm actually fix, uh, getting runs, filling in gaps in runs, uh, getting some of that stuff I've always wanted. So it's not really spectacular, but I still ended up spending a little bit of money there. It was, it was you know, found, found, uh, and found some great deals, right? So uh, one of the first things we saw when we got there were um, $5 trades and stuff, right? And I didn't go nuts because number one, they didn't really ha either I already had a lot of the books or I had the, <laughs> of course my computers. I'm, I've got people all over Twitter Facebook and Instagram liking the pictures of the cosplayers I put up, right? So for five bucks, the first thing I got was this hardback of the Liberty Legion. This goes back to uh, the 70s, the Bronze Age, where we had the Invaders, number five and six, Marvel Premiere, 29 and 30, Fantastic Four, annual number 11, Marvel 2 and 120, and the Marvel 2 and 1 annual number one, where we get some World War II action with the Thing, you know, solo Thing with some fantastic stuff. I I love the World War II characters, right? I love anything where they pull out from the past and stuff. Um, and uh, we got the Wizard in here, Miss America, the Red Raven, a uh, little bit of time traveling going on, some Nazis, a little fighting some Master Man. Now, I had these issues. That's what's wild, but they're collected. So this will just make it easy because the Liberty Leg Legion was a team that actually didn't have a whole lot of uh, appearances, if you will. So we got that for five bucks. <clears throat> I got a soft back of this. I had the trade of this um, in hardcover right here on the shelf. I had the original three issue miniseries. This is by Dave Gibbons of Watchmen fame writing. Dave Gibbons is quite the writer. The first time I saw him writing something is that he wrote the original Batman versus Predator miniseries, which was better than Superman. Yep, keep, keep, yeah, I'm getting all sorts of updates now. Uh, so it said here we have a world's finest soft cover. This is actually a gift for someone for five dollars But Steve Rue does some amazing artwork in this. We have Lex Luthor, Joker um, a Superman, Batman. He goes back to uh, a very retro style with them Here we go uh, You're turning into a daily show man. I've got to do what I can when I have time to do this stuff follow. Yeah, 
Um, the thing, Liberty Legion team up is one of my uh, all-time favorite stories. Eric Breen. Yep, absolutely. I mean, just fun stuff. Saw the comic book telling. All right, we got Brian Space Baby 227. What's up, man? Hello to you, too. Now, this one right here, this I think this came out in 1990. Some great Bo Hampton art. And this is one of those books that it, it's really not hard to find, but... I can't believe that I ran into it for $5. I was about to go to eBay and stuff. This is a Viking Prince hardcover from 1990, I believe. Uh, and I always wanted this because of the Bo Hampton art and because it's a fantasy story with the Viking Prince and, every, and all this stuff. Viking Prince is quite an old character at DC. So how he got a one-shot, let alone a hardcover, you know, graphic novel, hardcover uh, uh, standalone story blows my mind. Um, so I was really happy to get this. Sometimes you just need uh, a different kind of art. Uh, it's not quite painted, but uh, it looks like it might be colored pencils or something in here. I haven't really had a chance to get into it, but it's just really fantastic um, just to have a little something different there. You know, of course, it comes with a uh, dust cover. Just great stuff. But uh, it's called Viking Glory, and we'll read it. And if it's uh, something worth uh, talking about, I'll do a live show on it. Let me check some stuff here. Ah, Paulo Costo. He's right there. Costo is right there with me. Viking Prince by Bo Hampton. Yep, he's with it. Uh, can you silence that, or is that a mute point? I'll see my. <laughs> I'll see myself out. No, don't run away, Eric Breen. Um, not a lot I can do to really silence it because it will affect the microphone. I'm gonna get. I'm gonna try another phone here pretty soon. I'm having horrible problems with uh, phones. A friend of mine has the Brazilian edition of World's Finest. Need to get a version of that myself. Yep, that's right, Paulo. It's really good stuff here. Let's see if we got anything else going on here. Yep. Okay, we'll just leave it where it's at there. Okay. Uh, now, uh, Charts on 66 gave me quite the present, uh, a copy of Spider-Man 100. Um, I haven't had this comic book since the late 80s. I actually had it with the original stack of comics that were my stepdads and my uncles that I sort of, I wouldn't say inherited, but when they left them behind, I kind of grabbed them up. And I'm not quite sure what happened to it. So uh, thank you to Charlton 66 for this beautiful copy of Spider-Man 100. Very happy to have that. Okay, when cons have cheap, cheap trades, I'm always in danger of blowing my whole budget. Yeah, I have to watch myself, and I try to hit those first. There's been something going on in the last two, three years where two separate dealers, Heroes Con and another little smaller convention, where they told me they just go around uh, buying up uh, whole collections from people. And when they get those whole collections, they'll just go through and they'll have all the trades, and they actually sell those trades uh, for sometimes the soft covers are three to five dollars. Hard covers can be anywhere between five and ten. Uh, they're not real worried about them. We'll go over this, some of this stuff later. Now, if you saw uh, my Twitter and my Instagram, you saw me talk about running into an OG YouTuber who is still going, and it was fantastic to spot her and to meet her, and she knew who I was because we've been doing this forever. But uh, Comic Uno, maybe it's Comic Book Uno, but anyway, she has two comic books. She in Artist Alley. She had her uh, table set up with a partner, and they, she's uh, put out two comics. So she signed this. We took some pictures. I'm going to read this. This is called, they call her The Dancer. So uh, apparently it's about a ballerina whose parents were pretty much killed in front of her when she was eight years old. And I think uh, someone she calls the sensei uh, adopted her. So uh, I'm not sure, uh, you know, that's about as far as I got. I just kind of got through the, uh, through the first uh, couple pages to check it out. I was really curious, but good for a YouTuber to rise above and get published and stuff. And, you know, I don't think she went through Kickstarter and the Go-Go to do this. This is through uh, Short Fuse Productions. So I'm going to do a little uh, research to see what kind of company they are. Might be her company. I don't know. <laughs> okay. What do we have here? Uh, when Concepts, yeah, did, did I read that one? Yep. Everybody's just talking along, right? Now, I think I'm down to needing maybe one or two issues of having the entire Epic Illustrated run. This was Marvel's answer uh, to heavy metal to a certain extent. It was more American comic book guys, uh, some English guys. They pulled from quite a few people. Uh, I think this ran quarterly uh, from 80 to about 85 or so. 
Um, but this is just fantastic. I can't tell you what number it is because they did this. You have to look at the top and it says Marvel Magazine Summer 1980. They did it by season. So, <laughs> oh God, that's annoying. Uh, so anyway, this was just a really fantastic find. Um, needing number three, I think, with but that thing is jacked up since they said there was going to be a Dread Star movie, and there will not be a Dread Star movie because Epic Magazine number three was the first appearance of Dread Star, so it shouldn't really be that much. I'll get this box out of the way a little bit. So this was just fantastic find. I loved El Epic Illustrated when I was a kid. It's where I found Cerebus, The Last Galactus Story. Uh, just so many good memories with that book. Now, I got this because I'm a huge fan of the movie, and I had the video game on PlayStation in the 2000s. Uh, I still have this on DVD. I think I still have it on VHS. Uh, but The Warriors, the 1979 movie. The Warriors, Over the Edge, The Outsiders, Stand By Me. All of these movies sort of had a huge impact. Oh, my gosh. That's so annoying. Um, so, anyway, I have a Warriors number one. The artwork looked horrible in it. It's one of five. This is, I, I just happened to be moving around the boxes and found this inspired the Dabble Brothers, whatever company this is. So it's the official movie adaption. Um, but, you know, I like the Warriors. It'll be a, you know, a little something cool to have to go with the collection there. Now we're getting into stuff where it was a little bit retro. The first two issues that I have here, I'm definitely going to upgrade, but they're really, they're really elusive to me. They're not hard to find. I, can, I could get on eBay and stuff and get them. Um, but these particular two issues just always seem to elude me. But uh, now I have the entire John Byrne Fantastic Four run. And these are really rough copies. I think all these books were 50 cents a piece. What do we got here? Uh, you and Charlton 66 were telling about Pepe Moreno yesterday. Pepe Moreno's Generation Zero ran as a series inside Epic Illustrate. I think it was reprinted in a full graphic novel. Oh, oh, okay. I'll definitely check that out. Um, I've heard of a few storylines slash comics over the years that kind of went with that Generation Zero title or tag. Uh, so I'm not going to really comment on it, but that really does sound familiar. And if it's an epic, I know I've ran across it. Uh, getting back here, man, but uh, right here we have It's Clobbering Time, Fantastic Four 274 with one of the really striking and eye-catching covers. <laughs> gonna go with that i'm gonna go all uh, big lebowski dude here and just abide with that uh sound going on everybody's getting off work and checking out my stuff so basically you know uh just got this and then we got 275 and uh charlton 66 was really cool about this because as soon as he saw the cover i've never read this but basically the storyline is about uh she hulk was uh sunbathing on top of a building in new york and this sleazy looking dude uh, comes by in a helicopter, takes a picture of her topless, and is going to put it in a magazine. Uh, and it's all about her stopping her, I guess. So that's just really funny. I want that as my ringtone. Uh, you can have it. <laughs> uh, Pepe Moreno Reno did Batman Digital Justice. I do know that. Yeah, cool, man. Cool. All right, now, uh, really happy to get this. You guys, if you've watched my channel, oh, there's more here. Okay, picking up a few things. Uh, I'm a Captain Marvel, Black Adam fan, going back to the 70s when I was a kid, watching the Shazam uh, Saturday morning live show, the ISIS live show. He was, uh, saw his back up in the world's finest. There was some scattered Shazam Bronze Age comics around the house, and uh, there's a lot. There's a, quite a few, uh, few. I don't know, two, three issues where uh, the Marvel family and or Shazam popped up in DC Comics Presents. Here's number 33, a little bit beat up, 50 cents. Uh, but I got this, uh, Rich Buckler art inside of it, uh, Roy Thomas and Gary Conway all over this. And it's really fantastic because, uh, you know, it opens up with uh, Jimmy Olsen reading a Captain Marvel comic. And I'm kind of jealous because, uh, you know, they get to use the title Captain Marvel in the DC Universe where they can't do that in the real world. So, yeah, I just kind of grabbed that. Like I said, we're doing the thing where I'm nothing real spectacular. Charlton66, what's up, buddy? Doing that big haul video. And I've already told people at the beginning of this uh, to check out your haul video because you got some fantastic stuff and I got the low-key stuff, man. So uh, go watch Charlton66 uh, when he does his uh, haul video there. Um, here we go. John Jones. I love John Burns' run also. I find it's a bit of a uh, word text heavy to read, 
I lose interest sometimes. Um, it's just, I think some of that stuff's from a different era, different era. Uh, Droy Thomas, you know, Steve Gerber, if you really want some heavy text. Chris Claremont, back in the 80s. Go, go check out some of that stuff. Yes. All right. Uh, two Legion books here. I won't get into them because I really haven't had a chance to go through them, but, uh, I'm really backing up. I'm always trying to, uh, you know, get some Legion books. Oh, man. Everybody's off work. They're all over my social media. Uh, Legion of Superheroes, number 285. Going way back with some Paul Levitz jumping on there. Pat Broderick artwork. And then uh, I think this is where Keith Giffen, around the time Keith Giffen came on. But uh, this is Legion of Superheroes 287. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. This book really took off just a few months later with the Great Darkness Saga. So uh, getting those issues leading up to the Great Darkness Saga, uh, setting up the characters, Paul Levitz and Keith Giffen getting their uh, rhythm together, really took off. And I was talking, uh, Charlton 66 and I had a really good talk about the Legion and a few things. And the Great Darkness Saga would be the Legion of Superheroes Dark Phoenix story. Their, their great, uh, you know, they go up against Dark Side. He returns into the future. Now these issues here won't blow. You away. These issues here won't blow you away, but I had these when I was a kid. I bought them off the stand. I probably even had a subscription to this and the Silver Surfer by uh, Stephen Lahart, Marshall Rogers in the '80s. Uh, we're going back to '85. Fantastic ringtone. What we got here? I'm reading the All Star Squadron run. If Roy was paid by the word, he is a very wealthy man. No doubt. I'm enjoying the Legion books you got me. All right. Yeah, Charlton66. I can't wait to hear about uh, the Legion books that you're reading. See what you think about it now that you're diving in there. Uh, hopefully, you'll get the, uh, you know, maybe maybe it'll hook you a little bit. Can't wait to hear your thoughts on them, man. Cannot wait. But anyway, I sold these years ago, and I just took out the keys and kept them. Um, but, you know, looking back on it, this was kind of fun. The X Factor, I have number one. I, I guess I had a whole, like, I think 50 issue run of this when it first came out. Got it monthly. Uh, I have the Great Darkness Saga and the Curse as hardcovers. I wanted to read Earth War, but that comes after the Showcase Presents editions ended, so it hasn't been reprinted. I need to read the Earth War when it comes to Legion. And I think it's going to be my time to really do some Legion of Superhero videos because those have really been requested over the last couple months. And like I said before, I, I was wondering where this love was coming from and pretty much they're popping up in uh, the Supergirl TV show. But uh, it's, Marvel really went out of the way, at least from the reader's perspective, when, this, when X Factor was coming out. They were reuniting, they were reuniting the um, original X-Men again. And Jean Grey, Jean Grey had been dead from the Great Phoenix Saga. And Jim Shooter pretty much put out there that Jean Grey will stay dead unless there's a story that somebody can come up with. Well, they found a way to bring her back. And years later, we come to find out that even though he didn't write it and he was practically unknown and he pretty much broke into comics through years of writing the letters pages, Kurt Busiek was the guy that came up with the way to bring um, Jean Grey back. So they really shuffled. It looked like they really shuffled some stuff around. We had the Beast Angel in um, Beast Angel and Iceman in the Defenders. They ended that title. The last issue of that also became a Secret Wars two uh, crossover title. They had the Avengers pop up crossover with the Fantastic Four for a little two issue story that was the return of Jean Grey. They got John Byrne in there since he did the Great Phoenix Saga. Everybody was kind of pumped. They got Cyclops out of the X-Men in X-Men 201 by having, you know, hand-to-hand -hand combat, more or less, with Storm over the leadership of the X-Men, and he lost. Um, you know, he's kind of losing his mind over Jean Grey and Madeline Pryor and everything going on. Then we had X-Factor come on, and they come out and they have Bob Layton writing it and Jackson Geis doing the art, I believe. And Jackson's solid, uh, but Bob Layton came out there, and this is a Mike Zek cover, who I met at the, oh, I left my prints downstairs, but that's all right. But we have Mike Zek covers on this. But Jackson Geist did the artwork. And after the phenomenal stuff that Chris Claremont had done building up the X-Men for years, when this came out, I kind of felt like it sort of fell flat. Um, we had like generic mutants you know, coming out. Uh, they were doing this thing where the X-Factor is running around looking like Ghostbusters. They were disguising themselves as mutant hunters so they could go out, catch them, and then bring them back and keep them safe and train them. 
uh, just really convoluted. Uh, I mean, it was really bad. Uh, they even had a part here where they got to Beast and they went to see one of Beast's friends and she was supposed to be highly alternative and punk. And she talked about Elvis Costello, being a fan of Elvis Costello music. And it really was, it really felt like I had somebody's dad looking at my 12-year-old self and telling me groovy and cool. I mean, it was really painful. Louise Simonson, Simonson and Walt Simonson came on and really saved the book and pulled it back into that mutant world. Uh, and they even, you know, tried to use some of the things that were there. So as you can see, you know, some of these are upgrades and some of this is just nostalgia. This was a really great issue because I think this was the one where they talked about the 12 mutants that were going to save mutant kind or something. That was a really, that was a dangling pop plot line forever. Of course, uh, Cyclops going after Master Mold. There's probably going to be another issue in here somewhere uh, that'll pop up. Yeah, here it is. Number 15. Now, it's really interesting times right now. If you want the first appearance of Archangel and you want the last appearance of the Angel, now's the time to get on, get in there. Okay, what we got here? Straight in for some X-Factor. Brilliant. Nice knot here. Uh, Louise Simonson gave X-Factor the identity they needed. Dropped the Mutant Hunter angle was the best thing she did for a start. For a start. Yep, agreed. Awesome. So, uh, yes, yes. So uh, basically, I kind of picked this up, but this is like a low grade. This is like a, a, wait a minute. This is like a key that's sort of like a sleeper key. All right. This is the issue where they removed the angel's wings. Number fifteen. I still have mine that I bought off the rack, and when I saw this for fifty cents, I had to grab it. There's been some buzz about it. I've been I've been seeing this pop up in a few videos. I always cannot get over the synchronicity or the coincidence or the kismet, whatever you want to call it, where a certain book out of nowhere will have the attention of quite a few people. Maybe I'm missing some kind of uh, conversations or something, right? But also, if you want the first appearance of Archangel, now's the time to get it. That thing is booking for $20. That book used to be sky high and all this stuff, so I don't know what's going on, but I would definitely grab these two books just in case Marvel does something with the X-Men. Uh, you just never know where they're going to pull things from to throw in the movie. Uh, it's one of those safe and sorry things. It's not a speculation, but it's definitely one of those things where it's solid reads. They, they were, they've been hot books before, and they're kind of, nobody's really looking for them right now. And they've decreased in value. All right, I've uh, got this. Um, I love Mark Silvestre covers uh, with um, when he gets a hold of uh, Wolverine. I may already have this. I don't know, but uh, this is uh, X-Men uh, 234 when they were bi-monthly coming out twice a month back in the uh, late 80s. And uh, we had the Brood return and uh, plant a little something in Wolverine. The purples are freaking fantastic. Speaking of purple, Charlton 66 got me this t-shirt. Uh, there's a company I'll probably be talking about that sells t-shirts at Heroes Con and at Baltimore Con. Charlton 66 went to a comic book convention in Indianapolis and saw the booth, told them about Baltimore Con, and there they were. And uh, we got a deal, and uh, I got a great Metropolis shirt. He got a Nosferatu shirt. And uh, it turns out a year ago, my buddy Scott Connor that I went to Heroes Con with got me, the, as a surprise, the Wizards um, shirt that they have. They're the people that are licensed to actually sell these. These aren't bootlegs. Awesome. Thanks, guys. And then it was really wild because Charlton, I think, yeah, Charlton 66 and I were having a talk about Storm. And Barry, we started having a talk with Barry about Barry Windsor Smith. And I kind of told the story about how uh, Storm ended up losing her powers thanks to Forge. And then I find this uh, in the 50 cent bin. I have not read this since like 1985. This came out in 84. And Barry Windsor Smith came out and did a Life Death Part 2 around issue 298 or something like that. But uh, I'm going to have to read it. I don't want to say anything, but this may be, this may, might be the issue where uh, Storm loses her powers thanks to Forge, if you will. But we'll see. You know, and that's 30-some-year-old that's, that's memories. Uh, then I got this right here. Um, I, you know, I collect the movie adaptions anyway. And this was just sort of fun because I looked over here, and this was just a beautiful cover by Charles Vess doing the uh, movie adaption first issue on the cover of Hook. This is, that is a cool Captain Hook. I freaking love it. So that, that's actually something that might be framed. Turns out Charles Vess apparently did the uh, script adaption in this. 
looks like and Gray Mario was in this. Oh, I didn't even look at the credits. Pen and brush, Charles Vess. Penciled artwork, John Ridgway, Dennis Reuter, Gray Morrow. Calligrapher. Is that, oh my goodness. This actually could be something cool. I'll read it, and this could be like a little, art-wise, this could be a little something special. And Paulo, we brought this out the other night. I actually got to do a little research for about 10 minutes. Turns out issue 257 after this is the first appearance of Nebula. That's why that book was hot. So for years, at least around down here, I don't know about Baltimore and stuff, this was uh, about a $10 book. That's why I grabbed out the 50 cent book. I I was collecting, this is my Avengers for me. Uh, this was the the Roger Stern, John Bushima, Tom Palmer era was my Avengers. You know, um, I love the late 70s stuff, but when I was spending my money to get this stuff, this was mine. So I'd read this, they're in a Savage Land, Terminus pops up. And they were they were saying that I think they were trying to get rid of 256 with 257 by saying this was the first appearance of Terminus, which it isn't. Apollo is correct. But the next issue is the first appearance of Nebula, who has been in the Guardians of the Galaxy movie. So I kind of think there was either some confusion or um, a little bit of a conspiracy going on to get rid of that. All right. So a few other books that I got. What do we got here? All right, Charlton 66, you're absolutely right. Awesome cover. Charles Vest can do no wrong. Art-wise, that man can do no wrong. What else has he done that's not here? Charles Vest has done quite a bit, a lot of covers. He did some Spider-Man work. He did a, he really got on the map um, as best as I can tell uh, back in the 80s when they actually sent him to Scotland. Maybe it was Scotland. Marvel actually sent him to Scotland and he did this uh, Spider-Man graphic novel. They sent him to Scotland so he could walk around and take in the atmosphere and stuff. He's done stuff with Neil Gaiman. Uh, he's, he's been around since the 70s. And do not ever call him a comic book artist, comic book anything. When you meet him, he's a fantasy illustrator. Uh, Stern was a Marvel writing beast in the 80s. Yes, he was. Tons of covers. Yeah, you guys, yeah all you guys out there help uh, not here. If you have some great Charles Vest stuff you want to talk about, stick it in the comments for him. Bill Mantelow was too, highly underrated. Bill Mantelow uh, apparently gets a lot of love. Bill Mantelow was one of those guys that I just sort of took for granted. You know, he was a Marvel writer. Uh, in my mind as a kid, he was just hanging out at the Marvel Studios and would write anything. The fact that he has so many fans never ceases to amaze me. Uh, Stern gave the team more character than any other Avengers writer before or after. Uh, Charlton 66, Le Mantelow. Jumping up there to Eric, uh, Eric Breen, but yeah, yeah, the Roger Stern, uh, his, his, uh, his Avengers run was just fantastic. When he had the Masters of Evil finally storm uh, the Avengers mansion, I was in seventh grade and I was carrying those books to school just to flip through them. I mean, it was just amazing to me. I love that stuff. I came in at a very good time. Now, are there better eras with more energy and more excitement and stuff yeah the avengers had been established they weren't new and fresh at this point but man some of the stuff he did was just fantastic tom palmer inks i remember the colorist was christy skill and the stuff she was doing was blowing my mind tom palmer is my favorite inker of all time so that thing was just cookie cutter made for me um mantlo did a uh, great team ups yep it's sad hearing about Mantlo's accident at the end of the 80s. Yeah, yeah, really sad. And I've actually seen pictures of him in that hospital or rest home or wherever he's at. Uh, I'm trying to develop a theory that Mantlo was gunning for X-Men. Should, should Claremont ever leave? Um, cool, Paulo. I'd like to hear that. That'd be fantastic. I wonder if that goes back to the X-Men Micronauts crossover. I wonder if that's part of your conspiracy. There are a bunch of X-Men and Brotherhood appearances in ROM, plus Avalanche appeared in Hulk. Interesting. Interesting. Good point, Paulo. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Okay. That would definitely be something worth talking about. Um, now, I'm a fan of the Lone Wolf and Cub series, and these are through First Publishing. Um, well, 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 what do we have here? thought I had a few more. Apparently, I didn't. Have, but, yeah, there was a, I think I left two or three behind, so I wanted the Mike Plude covers. Uh, these are square bound editions that I absolutely love. Uh, I think the series ran about uh, somewhere in the 40s. Um, you know, it lasted a couple years and stuff. A lot of this was just uh, brought over from Japan. But it's Lone Wolf and Cub uh, with Mike Plue covers. 
and I would never ever guess these were Mike Plude covers. Um, this is a little bit of a different style for him. So I'm thinking he did it in the tradition of the Lone Wolf and Cub covers that came before. Frank Miller loved this series. That's exactly how I heard about it. And um, he actually did covers for the first, uh, I don't know, 12 or less issues when this came out. But Lone Wolf and Cub had a huge effect on him. Uh, you probably go back and read Ronin uh, and see where that, you know, how it influenced him. But these Mike Plug covers, I'm a Plug guy, man. They're fantastic. All right, picked up a little something not too special. Amy Chu signed this. I got this from my daughter. I want to mail it to her. She had it personalized for her. But apparently there's a Poison Ivy one shot or series out there cycle of life and death no idea what this is but grabbed it and sent it to my daughter another present that charlton 66 uh, gave me here was rom 37 and this is evan dorkin's first published work uh, i think charlton 66 told me he has a he's in the letter pages in this rom issue so paulo talks about rom and up bam here comes rom we bring up bill mantlo that's how the whole weekend went we would talk about something and then I might stick my finger in a box just kind of seeing what's in there and it's right there it was amazing and we're still doing it okay remember when Hercules wanted to kill Atlas and Thunderbolts over the mansion siege from Avengers those stories were 15 years apart yeah and it made sense uh they they were drawing from continuity and having these characters like they lived in that world of course Hercules wanted to ask did you see what they did to Jarvis yeah you know uh, Marvel uh, had writing and editing those days. Yep, there was a. That's when continuity mattered. Eric, then Bendis arrived and ruined everything. Uh, I bought a Mike Plu Cole issue and uh, was blown away by his work. It was like uh, the modern Eisner style. Uh, Mike Plu is a beast. He's so freaking good, man. He's one of my favorite artists. Um, I would see Plu work in like movie cart in cartoons, movie cartoons, backsheet cartoons like Wizard, and then I would be there'd be certain certain movies that I really liked as a kid, like The Thing, John Carpenter's The Thing, and it blew my mind as I got older that I found out it was Mike Plu doing all those after I was like in love with his werewolf art and stuff like that when I was a kid. Uh, Rom versus Milk and Cheese, well called, not here. That was awesome. That was awesome. I love references like that. Digging into the box, moving along here, guys, before I get more, um, yeah, my, you know, we stopped ringing, so let's see if uh, we can get through this. I'm down to needing number seven of this series, and I have, seven. I knew it, but I have number seven, I just need number seven of this series, and I'll have everything, every uh, one shot, every uh, spinoff uh, miniseries, everything that's going on, and apparently they're going back and forth. Is this going to be a TV show? Is it not? I really don't care because I love the series and uh, I have I was getting it in trade. I picked up the series. We're one issue from completing it. But The Boys by Garth Ennis, my guilty pleasure. The one that I love and I would not push this on anybody because some of the stuff they do makes me laugh. But I don't think a lot of people could handle it, really. But uh, this is a throwback to issue one. They made it to issue 50. This started out through DC with Wildstorm. They made it five or six issues. And then there was an incident with a hamster. Yes, an incident with a hamster where DC was like, we love you, Garth. Here's the rights. We just can't do this. And Dynamite picked it up. So it was fantastic. So there's issue 50. And I believe this is the last issue, number 72. This always had a beginning, middle, and an end. Uh, so now I can read it. I can finish it off. I did not want to finish reading the series without the last issue. There was just too much built up to where they had too many characters going forward, too many people messing with each other, too many stories just dovetailing for me to get to the last issue and not have it. Not, not happening. I was not going to let that happen. Woo! I missed a lot of comments. It looks like I missed a few comments. Uh, what I can see here is Paulo Costa. I don't think I've ever seen Todd McFarlane, Greg Capullo mention Mike Plug. Yep, a lot of talking going on. <laughs> a thing that happened to my friends apparently in that book. It could be. There's a John Sable issue that looks like it could have been drawn by McFarlane. Bloodbeard, I saw. Uh, <laughs> okay, I'm moving on to the books here. Now, like I said, nothing real spectacular, but there's books that have been elusive. And uh, it, it really cracks me up how these books can be elusive over the years. Uh, a couple years ago, and I kind of still keep an eye out because I'm so, if I've either finished them or I haven't, but I was getting all the crossover books. Uh, Secret, Wars, Secret Wars 2, I was trying to get all the Secret Wars 2 crossover books. 
I was tying books, if you will. Uh, Crisis on Infinite Earths, I was getting all of those. Uh, One million, I was getting all of those. And I think these are the last three that I need, maybe four. But for some reason, Our Man didn't so much get a one million issue. When DC One Million came out in the 90s, uh, DC had this idea of like, if our comics, re if Action Comics reached number one million, what year would it be? And they came up with the year. And then they had those heroes from that year that all these books would have hit one million come back in time, basically telling a Superman story. And we had a whole bunch of books come out with the versions of those heroes one million months from us, right? And they, of course, came back in time. And Our Man being a time, time traveling centered character, if you will, um, the robot version, not the original version, they had three issues of his series tie into one million. And these were impossible to find of all the books. I don't know if it was a low print run. I don't know why. I don't know why. They're not worth a lot of money at all, but they they were they're impossible to find. So when I saw these three issues, I was like, yes, grab them. One of the first things I picked up there. Nice. All right, guys, moving on here. Uh, Batman 1 million. We had Detective 1 million. We had Nightwing 1 million. You know, Action Comics, Superman, Man of Steel, all these books with characters with multiple titles and tie-ins and little worlds were there. So I wasn't taking the chance of missing out on Batman 1 million. So uh, we just went ahead and got this, you know. Legion Lost, talking about my Legion. Uh, Legion Lost was a 12-issue miniseries that came out after uh, DNA, uh, Abnett and Lanny with uh, Ariel Capelli. Uh, took over one of the Legion's superhero books and started writing, and then all of a sudden we had a 12-issue miniseries called Legend, Legend, Legion Lost, Legion Lost, Legion Lost. And basically it was a couple members of the Legion thrown across the universe trying to get back, and all of a sudden we have like survival in the universe trying to get home. Uh, and I think it took them over a year to get back and stuff, right? And this was hot. Everybody was talking about this. This is around 2000, yeah, in 2000. All of a sudden, it was like people were talking about the Legion again. That's what happens with the Legion books. They come in waves. They come in waves of people getting excited about them. Uh, and I completely missed out on it. I was married, had a two-year-old at the time. Um, you know, I just uh, really kind of missed out on a few things. I was still still doing my thing, hitting flea markets, but I was being a dad. And, of course, I would miss the event, which is, which is all right. So I just got issue one. They had, uh, you know, they had uh, some scattered issues for this uh, twelve issue mini series, but I I'm going to try to collect them all at once. So I'm going to start at the beginning and pick them up. No rush, no rush. I already know what happens. Hit one million. One million is awesome. Got it. Yes. Uh, in the future, every comic is a YouTube adaptation. That's funny. Uh, it's like Star Trek Voyager with DC superheroes. Yep, absolutely. I think DNA Legion have better personalities than the Voyager crew. Yep, yep. Uh, I could go off on Star Trek Voyager. I'm getting more... Since I, I tried to watch the new Star Trek Discovery, and it really makes me very forgiving for Star Trek Voyager. Uh, Seven of Nine really saved that show, and uh, it really gave us a little bit more integrity, if you will. And, was, and like I said, I ended up binge watching most of Star Trek Voyager just to really give it a chance. I, 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 did, I despised it when it came out. Okay, a little book. I'm also going to try to find a variant cover. This may be the variant cover. I don't know. There's two covers to this. And it's going to throw you for a little loop. But it's Guy Gardner Warrior where he opens his bar. Uh, the cover I'm looking for is Guy Gardner 29, which you turn it on its side. And they've done an homage to the Nighthawk, Nighthawks. If you guys have watched my videos, I have an intro way back when where I had that that great piece of art of the Nighthawks uh, sitting, you know, sitting in the cafe in the middle of the night, uh, just kind of panning over. I love that. I actually collect covers uh, and anything like that does an homage to it. So I'm keeping an eye out for that. I didn't even know that thing existed until about, I don't know, last six months. But in this book, uh, it's kind of like Guy Gardner opens his bar, and we open up the doors, and we see all the superheroes in here. So, yeah, that's just something, uh, you know, I was kind of wanted. Nothing major. 
Uh, Voyager only had one, only had good episodes and bad episodes. At least the Next Generation and Deep Space Nine had so-so episodes as well. I cannot get into Deep Space Nine. I have tried. I have tried. I hate the Ferengi. The whole show feels like they're taking props and costumes and stuff from Star Trek Voyager and just go in uh, the next generation and recycling them. Like, here's what we got. What can we use? I've tried to get into it. Some people love the show. That's why I don't come down on it. Uh, but when it comes to the next generation, uh, I love that one. I mean, I love my original Star Trek. I, I have them on DVD. I'm about to get rid of 50 VHS tapes of the original series. Um, you know, I have the comic books, the who's who and all that stuff. I mean, I'm not a trackie per se, uh, but you know, I just really am a fan of the show, but, uh, next generation is the one that I can watch over and over. And I think it's because I've watched the originals from the sixties, you know, on TV from the seventies to the early nineties and stuff. Uh, it's like listening to your favorite song, but you've just heard it so much. Oh, come on. Let's see some love for Chief O'Brien. That's <laughs> funny. I had uh, Nighthawks hanging in my college dorm room. Hop Hopper is awesome. Yep. Yep. I completely agree. All right. Now, uh, you guys who have been around for a while, you know that I've been on that quest to complete 300 issues of service, 300 issues of Hellblazer, the Vertigo series, right? And I've come to a decision because they're two different beasts. The... Cerebus is one great big huge 300 issue story about the life of a character. Uh, same writing, you know, Dave Sims writing, penciling the characters. Gerhard came on there, finished it out with them. So there's more of a consistency there. And when you read, I'm learning now, now that I've made it through the first 200 issues consistently, um, I'm seeing there's like, you kind of absorb that. You, you, you really get into that world, right? Where in with Hellblazer, it's great teams and filling issues and a lot of different uh, creative teams on there. And it's really inconsistent. So I think I'm going, uh, I know I'm definitely probably going to get the first 100 issues. And then I'm going to get anything Garth Ennis wrote after that 100th issue, the Warren Ellis issues. And I have some of those here. But the, the series, I really don't want to get 300 issues just to say I have the whole series when half of those, some of those stories I really don't like and they don't grab me. It's really given me an appreciation for Jamie Delano. Um, Jamie Delano never really blew me away because you have to understand this was when Frank Miller was hitting, Alan Moore was hitting, Neil, Neil Gaiman was rising up a little bit and stuff. And all of a sudden you have Jamie Delano who's sort of writing, he, they, this person felt like they were just kind of writing straight stories. Well, you live and learn and you grow and I was young. I was young. Remember I was in high school when this came out and Yeah, and all this stuff, right? But Jamie Delano issues haunt me when I read them. Uh, she really he she I don't know That's a I don't I don't know a lot about Jamie Delano, but uh, What setting up what she did for John Constantine uh, And setting up this whole series for the people that follow it. It was amazing Everybody talks about the Garth Ennis issues of where he gets lung cancer and he tricks the devil and all that stuff. But Jamie Delaney wrote Newcastle, issue number 11, which is just phenomenal. Dave McKean came on this book. Neil Gaiman did an issue. I have an issue here that uh, Grant Morrison wrote, number 25. Uh, seriously, the first 50 issues of this book is something special. Um, I mean, it's horror. It's vertigo and it's horror. And this was the rise of vertigo. Uh, and it, and it started out Hellblazer was not Vertigo yet. Swamp Thing was not Vertigo yet. Um, Sandman was not Vertigo yet. These this was the foundation. Uh, late to the party. We'll have to watch this from beginning to later. Yeah, come on back, Detective Twenty Nine. Star Trek Tribbles could be MC's. <laughs> Star Trek Tribbles could be MC's answer to The Walking Dead. Let's synchronize the uh, IPA. Oh, they're talking about Star Star Trek. So, uh, yeah, I have some early issues here. Number 31, going through some of these. But, like I said, some really good stuff with uh, Jamie Delano here. 32. There's an issue that Dave McCain came in here and did, uh, you know, writing-wise. 38. I hope you can see these. Yeah, yeah, go 39, going so far. Here it is. Yeah, Dave McKean. We have an issue with Dave McKean art. Dave McKean is the guy that uh, did the Sandman covers and, you know, You'll know the stuff. That's a double-sized issue. Uh, really, I was really surprised to see this. I need to look this up and make sure this is the book I'm thinking of, but this is number 60. 
when Preacher hit, um, Jesse Custer was hit with a force from above that blew up his church, and he had the word. They come to find out that that force was this entity of a, of a demon from hell and an angel consummating and having a baby. And people were starting to get the idea that it came from this issue. Uh, I'm going to look it up to be sure I'm telling you right. Garth Ennis wrote this. He wrote Preacher. You can see the cover here. Um, and this became a hot book until Garth Ennis said, no, no, no. That is not what happened. But I can go on. 143... You know, uh, and what's sad about me deciding to quit trying to collect all 300 issues of Hellblazer as of right now in, in my head, uh, I may change my mind, is that I am damn close to having them all. But I got in there, read some of them, and some of these, are, they're just not all winners, folks. They're just not all winners. But um, I think you get the point, okay? We're, we're in the late 80s here with some Hellblazer, okay? Some good stuff there. Found some very early issues. Now, what's funny about that is when I was con and i found these in dollar boxes uh they were actually actually in alphabetical order and they you know these people were organized uh these two i call them kids that i don't even, i have no idea if they were like 20 to 25 or something but i've been where they've been before it's like time has gone by and i'm on the other side of this i have done the thing where i have run into conventions or comic book stores with a plan thinking that nobody's going to be getting this book the buzz is over with or they don't know about it you know i'm the only it feels like i'm the only one that knows about it and I hear, oh no, he's smashing those. And I turn around and it's this kid dressed like John Constantine and his sidekick buddy who decided to watch the perimeter. They were trying to have some fun with it. He had his old school, I was so impressed with this kid because he whipped out his paper and he said, I thought he said he needed Constantine issues in the 200s. No, he's needing 200 issues. And he had it on paper. Yes, old school on paper, the issues he needed. So, uh, I sat there and I just started handing him the books because I've been there. I've walked in when you think you, you see somebody going through there and you know, you know they're going to grab the shit you need. Um, Damon King is the uh, only threat to Bill Sinkovich. <laughs> Sinkovich, excuse me. I can see that. Uh, anyone who hasn't read Hellblazer, be warned. It's deep and heavy. Just stick it out. Great, but I feel I relate more being from England in my opinion. Uh, Sienkiewicz is uh, Carlos Santana. McKean is Joe Satriani. Whoo, you guys are going deep on this. Now, let me tell you something. I'm talking about personal taste here with some of the Hellblazer stories that come along. Um, you know, Hellblazer is fantastic. Don't get me wrong. Across the, What they've done with this character, uh, built him up. They have him aging in real time. I think, actually, I think it was Paulo who made a comment there one time when I was talking about it, about his smoking reflects his self-destructive nature. Anybody that crosses his path is going to get screwed. Uh, he can be a bastard when he needs to be. But the thing about it is, is that he is English. So that comment there about uh, being from England and stuff, I totally get that. There are probably things written in this book that, you know, probably resonates with you being from England. You know, and over here, it just sort of adds to an atmosphere. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's sort of like you're a tourist in England and he's talking about things that you're just not quite... When White Stripes wrote a song called I'll Have a Ball and a Biscuit, I had no idea what the hell he was talking about. And I heard, I was told that was an English term. There you go, you know. Cool. All right. Guys, we're, all, we're almost done here. We're almost done. Uh, a few other things that I grabbed here. I got some prints, and Charleston 66 actually gave me a original art comics page from Legion 90 that I'll show in another video because I didn't bring them up here. I'm wore out. need to work on my sleep. Uh, we'll just slow down here, right? So there was a, uh, there was some, there were, I think it came to 12 comics that I needed. But this particular table had buy 20 books, get 20 for free, and it came to 20, to came, wait a minute, buy 10 books, get, no, I think it was, I'm already messing this up, I can't remember. I think it's if you buy 20 books, you get 20 for free. And I could not find 20 extra books. I was throwing stuff in there for Charlton 66, trying to split up the stack so I could just hand them a 20 and go on. Um, so I got a few, because there was the stuff I needed in there, right? So uh, I got this, uh, I always pick this book up. This is a very underrated book that a lot of people don't know about. Actually, I'm the only one that I can think of that's talked about it in YouTube. I know Dr. I mean, uh, oh, who's that channel? Oh, Comic Crypt of Castle Hill or something like that. He bought it on my recommendation. 
But this is a Wildstorm uh, Wild Spotlight featuring Majestic number one by Alan Moore. And it's the end of the universe. We have Mr. Majestic, who is Superman. We, we know he's an, uh, you know just another Superman character, if you will. And Alan Moore has wrote the last day of the universe, where everything's dying. And we get to see the immortal creatures that have been able to survive uh, to the very last days. And now entropy is taken over, and we get to see how the universe ends. Uh, this is a very deep, very cool, very, very cool comic that I love. Um, very sophisticated. Um, it's straightforward, but uh, it does not insult the readers. And it came from Image. Imagine that. Okay. Bradbury, Bradbury Comics. I collect these. They're through Tops from the 90s. They're sealed with, um, you know, cards in them and stuff. But these adapt uh, Ray Bradbury stories. Uh, there weren't very many of them made, and they're fantastic. 20 for 20. Thank you, Charlton. Thank you, buddy. I'm glad you were out there. The Wanderers, this is the infamous issue that I was talking about. Um, I've talked about it before on here and stuff, but, uh, you know, me, me and Charlton 66 were sort of talking about it. And uh, it pops up. I stick my finger in a box. I just flip through a couple, and there it is. But this is Wanderers number 12 of the future. This, this is in the future in the world of the Legion of superheroes they took an obscure team that popped up i think during the 60s or 70s and there's a history of what happened to them but this particular character that's hugging the um the little dinosaur that may or not you know we it could be it could be several kind of different dinosaurs but uh he's a shapeshifter and this is the infamous issue of the only reason people who were there remember the wanderers why this book has kind of had a little bit of uh infamous infamous feel to it when you say wanders is because he shapeshifts into a dinosaur and mates with that dinosaur so it'll be pregnant to keep the race alive take that in yeah uh this is a book of uh, power man hour fist 119 a john byrne cover i had this book when i was a kid i think it was given to me when i was getting my appendix out with a stack of books couple years ago I decided to sell a bunch of Power Man um, and Iron Fist books and stuff and I regretted selling this one you know it's a John Byrne cover I found that and then uh, to fill that out I ended up just grabbing to get that 20 for 20 I ended up just grabbing through those boxes I just grabbed a whole bunch of Fables books uh, some Vertigo stuff uh, nothing real spectacular there let me check the comments Enjoy the two live shows y'all did. Did not see them live, but caught them later. Thanks, Detective 29. Yeah, we had a blast doing those. Uh, Grab this because, again, John Byrne fan, but, you know, in the middle of the who's who, John Byrne, excuse me, John Byrne came in and revamped Superman, so he got to do a cover of, who, of who's who. Uh, this probably makes my second or third one. This was actually very hard to get. Out of all the issues of Who's Who, this is the one that disappeared off the stands, and it was because John Byrne, the superstar, came on to Superman. Everybody wanted it. Um, years later, I think in a Who's Who update, they finally gave the Silver Age Superman his due and gave him his own um, Who's Who entry. Uh, the Silver Age Superman, you know, you had your Golden Age Superman, and then you had the Silver Age Superman, who kind of disappeared because we had the story... Uh, whatever happened to the man tomorrow that gave him closure, but he didn't really uh, get his credit. He, I don't think he really got... Um... Hey, Steve, look what, what page I opened up to. The Star Hunters. Yeah, Charlton66 will get that. He'll get that. But uh, let me see. Let me make sure I'm talking right in here. Nope, he's in here. I'll take it back. But, uh, you know, Silver Age Superman really didn't get his love after John Byrne revamped him for the modern age of the 80s there. But he's in there, so that was kind of cool. Let me make sure. Eh, I'll get into it and read it later. I have a feeling that was the, the uh, they let Kurt Swan draw that entry, and it was the new revamped John Byrne origin. Um, you think Wonders is weird? It sounds like a typical fan fiction. Uh, did not get gender bender furry porn. Uh, Christopher Priest and Mark Bright uh, had a nice run at the tall end, uh, at the tail end of uh, PNB, yeah, Power Man and Iron Fist. Yeah, those were really good. I really liked Mark Bright's work. Mark Bright was one of those guys that I was always happy to see him on something. Unfortunately, I started seeing him um, pop up a whole lot in Avengers Spotlight. It made me nervous because those were like, that was an anthology series where you get two Avengers solo stories. And he started really popping up in that. 
I've heard about Star Hunters and would love a trade paperback of it. Uh, Nails, nice. Well done. Charlton66 is the man talking about Star Hunters. I have three issues here, and it's actually a, a comic that just by looking at it, I kind of rib for looking like the cocaine 70s. Uh, after seeing some artwork that Charlton66 had, has by Bob Layton, some original artwork, and hearing him talk about it a little bit, I'm going to go back and I'm going to read that book with more forgiving eyes. You know, um, you know, as long as I don't hate it as bad as I do Booster Gold, I think everything's cool. Last stack, guys. Last stack. Yeah, yeah. We've been over here a little bit over an hour. Um, I'm probably going to end up making two more videos to actually upload as videos. But i uh, got this, Secret uh, Origins with the New Gods. There was some really good talent in this book. That's what made me pick it up. It really surprised me who all wrote and drew in this. And then, um, yeah, I'll just, we'll show you this one first. Um, found these. I think these were, these were from the 20 for 20. Um, 80s reprints of uh, the Neil, Adam, Neil Adams stories of uh, the classic X-Men before Claremont came on and before they just started doing reprints. Really interested in seeing these. I love my dinosaurs, which is Sauron. Yeah, good stuff. Sentinels and Sauron, Neil Adams, good stuff. Man, all kinds of people in my driveway. Finally, I think I have all the issues of this. This is from uh, this is from Epic Comics of the 80s. I saw this advertised all over the place, but it's apparently the story of the Black Dragon, a number one, it was a six issue miniseries, and it was Chris Claremont and, let me make sure I get it clear, John Bolton. So uh, John Bolton ended up doing the backup issue, backup stories in classic X-Men where Chris Claremont, they would reprint the run of X-Men from Giant Size X-Men up, you know, where John, uh, Chris, Chris Claremont, you know, took over and stuff. And then Chris Claremont would write new stories to expand on those stories, sort of retro tales that weren't, you know, new information for us and stuff. And John Bolton would do it. But anyway, this was advertised all over the place in Epic Illustrated and in, in the Marvel Comics. Uh, I would see, I think I saw it in Amazing Heroes or something. So uh, we're going back in time and getting those. And the next thing I'm probably going to check out is uh, Swords of the Swashbucklers. I'm buying so few new comics now and stuff, it's kind of like making me want to go back and appreciate some of this stuff. So I have uh, five to six issues of Black Dragon, and I'm pretty sure uh, I have the missing issue somewhere here. And then this led into an advertising of Moonshadow. And uh, this, this got some love when I showed the two issues of Moonshadow I found at an antique shop. I now have 12 issues of Moonshadow. Can't really tell you anything about it other than that I found it real interesting that Epic, Marvel's Epic, did 12 issues in the 80s. And all of a sudden Vertigo reprinted the issues through, their, through, through Vertigo with new covers. Same story. So I had to be very careful. See what I'm saying about the advertisement being everywhere? So... But uh, this looks very interesting, J.M. Demites. And uh, this this series got some love, but I mentioned it last time in a haul video. that They loved it. So uh, it'll be real interesting to see what this is about. And I love, I really like uh, this, this epic line of comics that Archie Goodwin was over. Really great. I mean, look at that cover. That is so cool. It's fantastic. He's got a gun. Yeah. There we go. And then I have uh, the missing issue I needed my Legion, uh, you know, five-year reboot, if you will. Uh, number 16, this, this cover connects with issue 17. Uh, and, for, you know, and it kind of eluded me a little bit. But uh, that's a, I think that's Laurel Kent. I think that's her name. That doesn't sound right. But she's a Daxamite, I'm pretty sure, who uh, ends up being the replacement for Supergirl after Crisis, you know. All right, guys, do you have any questions or anything? Is uh, Star Hunters written by David Mickelney? Uh, Michael? Yeah. I think I only saw that as a write-up in Comics Journal. Yeah, Apollo and everybody's talking about that. Okay, cool, man. All right, guys. Unless anybody's got any questions, I'm going to freaking eat, take a shower, and try to unwind to go to bed and probably bag and board some of this stuff. I'm exhausted, and uh, I'm so wired I can't sleep. Uh, I know I'm slurring and talking like I'm drunk and stuff, so thanks for hanging in there with me. Thanks to Charlton66 for all the great stuff, uh, the good times. Uh, just I really appreciate it. I had a great time. And uh, here's the Baltimore um, yearbook 
the comic books. This year's theme was Strangers in Paradise, and they got a lot of artists who were at the con to go in and do these uh, pinups in here, and they collected them and made this book. So I thought that was really cool. Um, a lot of great artists in this. So I'm going to enjoy that. And then uh, Steve also took me to a bookstore. We ordered pizza. We had 20 minutes to kill, and he took me to a used bookstore. I ended up getting a record. I ended up getting some Philip Jose Farmer books I might talk about in a separate video. But I ended up getting this. This came out in the 90s. This collection came out in well, 10 years ago, and I wanted this collection uh, because there's extra bonus stuff in here and stuff. But this is Red Rocket 7 by Mike Allred, and this is pretty much about... The history of rock and roll mixed in with some science fiction and clones and stuff. This has uh, Mike Allred starting with Elvis, all the way up to David Bowie in the 90s, Iggy Stardust, The Beatles, Brian Jones, Dead Rock Stars, uh, Rock and Roll, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, uh, just everything in this. I've always wanted to read this. Uh, to me, I built this up in my head as being a classic rock opera for uh, from comic books and stuff. So it's, an, it's no wonder I couldn't find this thing. It's a, there were seven issues of this that came out, and this is a collected edition. You can see that it's very small and very unusual looking. So I may end up doing a review of this with the shaky cam going through this. So I can't wait to read that. I've forgotten Red Rocket 7 existed. Um, I've unfortunately been unable to forget that it existed because uh, I've never been able to find it. I found an issue or two in a box somewhere over the years, and that was it. I just never saw it. Not, this came out, the series came out in 1998 when my son was born. So I was playing daddy and stuff and couldn't get around to the comic book shops, nor did I have the inclination to want to, if that makes sense. So, yeah, I missed out on a few things. Uh... I'll send you that Swan interview. Awesome. It sounds like you guys are really getting into stuff. I found it. He disliked drawing Legion of Superheroes because of all the characters and some of the writing. Oh, gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, I had forgotten Red Rocket existed. I already read that. I have something called One Model Nation. It features a craftwork uh, pistache. The story is written by the Dandy Warhol's lead singer and ours Mike Allred clone. Yeah, I think this might be it because it mentions the Dandy Warhols are in this. I know I butchered that trying to read it, but I can't get my eyes to focus. I'm so freaking tired. All right, guys. Man, we got a lot of people out there. Thanks for hanging in. Thumbs up. Share this. Get it out there. Um, I have a few ideas to slow down a little bit on some of these books. Of course, we're doing the live show here with my hauls. After I read some of this stuff, I might slow down and do regular videos that upload that you can just watch if you want to, man. But sub, get this out there. Thank you, Charlton66. This weekend was made possible. This haul was made possible. These videos were made possible over the last couple of days because of that, man. Can't praise it enough. And uh, you guys be cool to each other. Later. Be excellent. Thanks for popping in. Later, guys.